and we're back. I'm Glenn Levin, Director of the Art and Code Festival, and we are about to have the third presentation of our Saturday afternoon presentation series uh, for Art and Code Homemade. And I'm thrilled to welcome Tatiana Moustakos, who is an interdisciplinary sculptor, illustrator, new media artist, doll maker, and educator. Her work focuses on craft and interactivity in a scale that creates an intimate experience between people and objects with a sense of humor, delight, and surprise. Tatiana Mostakos. Hi, thanks so much for having me and thanks so much for hosting this talk or the series of talks. It's been really exciting to watch. I'm just gonna jump in and let me share my screen. So welcome to my talk. Um, so I'm gonna focus primarily on one of my disciplines, which is doll making. And I got into doll making because my mom is an antique doll collector. So when I was a kid, she would always go to these doll shows. And if you don't know what a doll show is, because probably you don't, um, it's like a big auditorium where lots of people go and they have like tables full of their own um, dolls that they have or dolls that they've collected. And there's just such like a large variety. So I would go and I would help her set up and then I would like spend the day walking around and they would have like tables that are full of like stuffed animals or vintage Star Wars collection action figures. Um, they would also have like some of the more weird stuff was um, dolls where the face is a carved apple because uh, fruit can be a medium <laughs> um, and they've somehow not rotted but they're like and they range from like a really old like 50 years old or more. Um, probably the older ones are not as in good shape but uh, they also look pretty interesting. <laughs> Um, but also stuff like um, fake bird cages with a little animatronic bird that will flap its wings and sing a little bird song. Um, so I go, went to those and they also had booths where people would sell dolls that they'd actually made. And from going through those for a while, I decided um, that I was gonna make my mom a doll for her birthday. So that's how I got started. And then I kind of never stopped, um, but here's some of my dolls. <laughs> Um, so the dolls that I make are specifically ball jointed dolls and what a ball jointed doll is, is um, if you think of like a Barbie, a Barbie's legs just like circle around a pivot, um, which is like one degree of freedom, but a ball jointed doll has like a ball that fits into a socket and basically moves um, around and I'll show you, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. But so a ball jointed doll has a ball that fits into a socket. It's strung together with elastic and that holds it in place um, also with tension. So if I move it, it just like stays. And this is a got two joints um, for the body. So like the torso is jointed and then it's got a joint for the shoulder and the hips and the neck. But you can also get like more joints. So this one has um, an elbow joint. You can see um, the elbow opens and closes, which gives it like a more natural movement and like the wrist moves, the head can rotate. Same with the legs, so it can kick um, and go back to screen share. Um, so these are some of my dolls. And this is a diagram showing how the elastic ties, it goes from one leg through the head back to the other leg and then one from each of the arms. And so I make dolls, but then another discipline that I'm interested in is programming and coding. And since I work in uh, multiples a lot, something I think about is the difference in creating something physically versus digitally. So if I were to make like these dolls here that I have on the screen, if I were to make like five of them, the easiest way for me to do that we would just make um, like five dolls that are maybe similar, but they're not exactly the same. And uh, if I'm making something digital, like the opposite is true. So even with like baking, if I'm making cookies, they're pretty similar, but they're not identical. But if I'm in like a virtual world and I want five digital cookies, the easiest way to do that would be like, I sculpt one cookie and then I copy and paste it. So it's exactly the same. Whereas um, in real life, there's a, like natural forces and things that change it and make it. So there's just like a natural variation that occurs. Um, so something that I've found to, for personally to bridge the gap between that is procedural generation. Um, so going from these physical dolls that I made, I wanted to try making digital ball jointed dolls. And this is a printout of a ball jointed doll that I made in Blender. And I'm gonna scroll through this and then I'll show you 
the blender side of it more, but this is a, I generate a 3D file that makes all the different parts for the doll. So then I can just run it through the 3D printer and then it makes it all, <laughs> and then you, yeah, you string it. Um, so the way that I did this is in Blender. Let me minimize that. So here's just a, one of the pictures earlier for reference. And this is the program that I wrote. Um, so Blender, if you don't know, is an open source 3D modeling software, but it's also based in Python. So it has the ability to script. And if you look here, if I like add, oh, open my, um, if I add a shape, um, yeah, it just like puts it up and you can move the location, X, Y, Z. And if you see here, um, so this is, I just added a meta ball and I'll show you what a meta ball is in a second, but it has like this really complicated code, which takes a little bit of parsing. So what I did was I kind of wrote like um, an easier version to do that. So I made a, um, and this is just the basic stuff, but I just made like a code where you call, make like add meta ball and then you just give it the X, Y, Z and the radius, and then it runs that script for you. So that's um, parsing the way that they do it into my own code. Uh, but back to it, um, the main way that I made this is, and I'll talk about the code a little more in a second, is uh, with meta balls, which I mentioned. But a meta ball is basically a shape that connects to itself. So if I have two meta balls and I bring them closer together, you can see they're like becoming the same shape and that was, um, when I found out about that, I was like, wow, that's great. <laughs> that does a lot of the work for me, um, which I think uh, if I'm making like a digital thing, it's really important to find a way to make the tool do a lot of the work for you. So with this, it's easier for me to make an organic shape um, instead of like, if I wanna make like a neck, I can just make two balls and then it automatically can join instead of having to worry about the geometry and all the vertices uh, that kind of does that for me. So the way that I generated this doll was I made the head first and let me run it. So if you run it, it uh, change, like it makes a new one each time. And the head is always different, the body is always different. But what I do first is I make the head and the head has different options. Like it has a function for making the eyes, for making ears, making like a back of the head. And not all of those always run. So I could have one that has like a longer snout, one that just it has a flat face, one that has ears, one that doesn't. Um, and then it stores the value of what I've generated um, into that body. Um, so first we make the head and then I stored the value for the radius of the neck because the neck has to fit in to there. And this is informed by like my knowledge of the traditional doll making, which is like something that's been around for thousands of years. And because I know how to make a doll with clay, um, once I'm approaching it from a different medium, which is like blender in this case, I know like where I can take liberties. So I know that it needs to fit in, but if it's not perfect, like that's fine. Um, it can just be like good enough and it will work and it will uh, still operate and move around functionally. Um, so I store the value for the neck radius of the top and then I go in and from there I make the neck. The neck in this case is just like the hull of two spheres. And then I store the radius for the bottom of that neck. I bring it in. Then I like make the body, which is this piece. And this piece is, it's not, so it's just like, um, I showed you the doll earlier that had two a two part torso. This has a one part torso. But what it has also is the holes for the shoulders and for the hips. Um, Sorry, I don't know how to turn that off. <laughs> um, yeah, so it has the shoulders and the hips. So it generates the body and then it stores the value for the hip radius, the shoulder radius. And then with those, I go in and I like generate the leg, I generate the hand, and then I generate like the arm, the arm length informs like the length of the leg. And it generates, um, even within the arms, there's differentiation. So they're each at like different angles. And when I make stuff like this, um, or like this example, for example, um, I feel like it's more of a collaboration with the computer because I can go in and I can look at my code. And my code is a work in progress, but it's also, since I'm making it for myself, it's not something that I 
ever have to finish, it can be kind of an extension of my practice. So I can always like come back to it and I can be like, oh, maybe I want them to have like really weird fingers. Uh, so I can go in and script that. And as long as it works for me, it's something that like I can just continue making them. Cause even in like a more traditional uh, like clay, um, like I am not making the same doll every time. Like I go in and I like, maybe if I try a different year that I've never done before. So that's also something that you can do like in the code. And um, it's more of like, a, I feel like it's a collaboration with the computer, even though I wrote the script. But if I go in and I say, I want this doll to have a long like nose, then I can tell it to do that. And it will still generate a new one for me that I don't have complete control over, but I have like, I'm like suggesting it and then it goes and it does it for me, uh, which I think is really cool. Um, yeah, so it's informed by my knowledge of traditional using clay. I can also show you one. Let me stop sharing the screen for a second. So here is one that I printed out yesterday and it's got a little face and legs and arms and it fits together and you can like move it around. Let's share the screen again. And something that I also think is funny is like I make these dolls, um, but when I make them, I'm just making like a creature. I'm not generally making like, oh, this is like an alligator or something. I just make like a creature that isn't something specific. But then when people see them, they're like, ah, oh, that's a bear. And I've always thought that was funny. But then I made this and I like generated this one and I saw that I'm like, that's a cow, <laughs> which doesn't make sense because it's I wrote it also and I know that it's not anything, but it's I think that comes from like the collaborative aspect of like not having full control over it. So your mind just like makes assumptions. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, the second project I'm gonna show you is um, where'd it go? this one. So this, I made a tiny overcoat generator. And what this does is I will show you him and stop sharing my screen for a second. So this is a doll. <laughs> I wrote a program that specifically generates codes for this specific doll. And then it generates a pattern for the code. And then what I did was I ran it on an embroidery machine, sewed it together, and then he can wear it. So he's wearing two right now. You can layer them much like normal clothes. I'm gonna share my screen again. Yeah, so I made this on P5JS, which is another open source program. And this one is for creative coding. So if I open this, um, this is like the pattern generator. The way I made this was I used muslin and I made it like in real life, I made a pattern for a coat that fit this doll. And then I scanned it and I uploaded it. And I looked at like the XYZ coordinates for all the specific points for that pattern. And then I wrote that to generate the shapes that I had. And then I went in and I added um, variables for randomness. Um, so if I press spacebar, it's going to generate me a new one. And it also has like different features. Uh, since I wrote this for myself, I added more customization within the script. So if you press space and I like like this, but I wish I had sleeves, then I can just go in and press S. Or I like that, but I don't like the waist. Um, so I can press the key for that. I can change the buttons. I can give it a different neckline. And once I'm happy with it, then I can save the file and it's already to scale. Um, so once I have the pattern, I brought it into P Embroider, which is another open source. Um, this is a project I worked on with Ling Dong Huang and Golan, which is a open source um, file generator for embroidery machines. And one of the features that I found really useful in it was um, you can just give it an image which is I gave it just the pattern image that I generated. And then you can go and specify the outline of the shape and the fill of the shape. So it has different fill options. Here's some hatching. Um, you can use Perlin noise, which I thought was really pretty. So that was one of the ones I used for the codes. There's also full color filling in with like a satin stitch, which is what this example is. Um, so this is a file that I fed in. This is it in P Embroider after telling it to do a Perlin fill. And this is it printed out. It prints it out in this shape. Something I inspired this um, project was I was really interested in seeing how the embroidery can 
add structure to the fabric. So in sewing this, I just have to like sew it together, but it's already embedded in the fabric. Like each piece is it's specific. It's like sturdier because it has the embroidery backing um, and it fits together perfectly. And here are some of the results. And it makes everything like small waistcoats to like longer overcoats um, just because it's just like a couple more variables that gives it like a lot more differentiation. And that's another thing um, that I find useful in with procedural generation is that you can just give it like suggestions that basically with like random variables and then it finds something within that. So you don't have to specify I want it exactly this length, but even if you want to, you can do that. Uh, so I think that freedom is really nice. Um, so the next project I'm going to talk about is this mechanical puppet. <laughs> so I made this as part of my residency at the Studio for Creative Inquiry, which due to paperwork started the same day that lockdown started. So I started my residency and I had really wanted to make an animatronic, but then I was like, I don't actually have all the tools available that I thought I would have. Um, and I wanted to make an animatronic. So I was like, I thought about it. I was like, okay, well, I already know how to make things out of clay really well because that's a medium that I'm super familiar with and in my head I was like well if I'm making an animatronic I have to use like a 3d printer I have to print things that are precise and completely fit together accurately and I have to find a way to make like a metal armature and like move it with motors but then I thought well I could just use clay and I can use what I have and I can make um I can make it that way so I made this is him without his face his face is made of silicone <laughs> um I made this animatronic doll, which uses the same joint system as a ball jointed doll. Um, you can see here, it's got like a knee, a hip, arm, shoulder, wrist, elbow, but also a face. And then it's on a bigger scale. So this is about like a foot and a half tall, I think. Um, and then it uses a pulley system. So I used literal paper clips, <laughs> what I embedded in the clay to tie this, I bought fishing wire, um, to kind of channel the pulleys through the arm so that it didn't get tangled and that it could, when you pull it, um, the arm goes up. And then when you aren't pulling it due to gravity, it, like it's heavy, so it unbends. Same with the legs, pull it and it kicks up. And here you can see the pulley system that goes through, but it also comes out the back. So there's like a hole in his back. So when you pull it, um, you can see what you're doing and you can have access to that. So this was kind of using, um, whereas with my overcoat project and with my generative ball jointed doll, I was using the traditional practice to inform the computer side. For this, I was using like my, like my knowledge of CAD and stuff like that and thinking about, um, like rapid prototyping processes and how they how you make things, but then I was taking that and bringing it back into the traditional. Um, I'll show you a little video, but this is the inside of the head. So the head has a jaw that moves, and you can see it's open here as well as eyes. The eyes were also informed by um, my mom has some antique dolls that have eyes that have like a hinge in the middle of the head. And it's got a weight at the back so that when you lay the doll down, the eyes close, like it's sleeping. But then when you sit it back up, they open and that's just gravity. Like there's no, it's just a simple hinge that like uses gravity. And I think that's wild. <laughs> um, like it's really simple, but then it makes a lot of sense and it's really effective. Um, so I have a silicone face that goes over this and it slots into like these places so that it stays perfectly in place. And then uh, the elasticity of the face also holds the jaw closed. This is how the jaw works. It has a hinge. And then same with the eyes. And this is it with the face on. This is it without it. And this is a little video showing the arms. Oh, 
pull it up and it goes up. And then a video of your face. Oh, it just peels off. <laughs> and you can see the mechanisms inside and that's also a pulley system, which the back of the head was open in the earlier pictures. And it just fits. So I had made the face originally out of clay and then I designed the back of the face to fit perfectly into the clay face shell. And then that way that I knew um, that the, that it, like, I knew it fit perfectly so I made a cast of the face uh, with alginate and then I used silicone, which I colored with foundation so that it matched the color. Um, and then I just put that on. And then, so then the final thing I'm gonna show you is um, Algorat. So Algorat is a art rat based um, media collective that I have with my friends Char Styles, Caroline Hermans, and Connie Yi. And basically what Algorat is, is we just like come together and we like brainstorm and we're just like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we made this fun little project and then we just make it and then we put it out. And it's kind of for us, it's just for, like to have fun and to be able to make stuff that's like digital and just like brainstorm. But also it's for like people to it's just for fun. So when I think of homemade, I think of like the act of play and like joy. And that's, I think really evident in like this, cause we just like come together and we like have a fun project cause it's funny. And we're just making like rats um, that you can customize. So this project is called Sweater Rat Creator and it's a 3D rat and then there's a sweater. And this was, um, we made this in the winter, I think last year. Um, and you just draw on it and then shows up on your rat. change the color, you can rotate him. Um, and then we have a rat maker where you can make a rat and you can randomize it. So you have this, um, yeah, just randomize it. <laughs> you can change the background. Maybe you want like a big foot in the back or you want a thumbprint or maybe you just want a road and maybe you want to be a giraffe and you can have your eyes closed or you can have money eyes or fangs and you can add some friends um, and you can decorate it with the roses um, or diamonds. Um, you can be blushing or you can be crying or you can be blushing and crying. And then you can set the frame. And then we also have Algo Times, which is a generative Valentine's maker. We scraped, I think, Hallmark to make, um, so we took Valentine's Day filler text, and then you click regenerate, <laughs> and it makes you a Valentine's, and this is good because I think, um, not Thanksgiving, because uh, Valentine's Day is coming up next month. Uh, love is like an endless love and a haven for life. Gorgeous. You are my heart loves more special. The faces all my endless romantic movies. So this is a Markov chain and it gives you a different rat every time. And then when you like click it and draw it on the screen. Um, but then another thing we do is we come together and we make uh, birthday cards for everybody. Uh, so we'll make birthday cards for our friend, um, our friends. We don't, we have more than one friend. Um, so this is like one that we made for Caroline last birthday. And we just have like videos. This is just, just um, this is made on glitch. And we just brainstorm really like, wouldn't be great if it had this. Um, this is another one, this was for Char. Um, this one is a little more interactive. You like uh, water the plants and then they grow. And once they're all growing, it plays a little tune and it rains rats. <laughs> and then this is our latest card, which we made for Connie, which it was her birthday last week. I'm not sure if she's seen this yet, but happy birthday, Connie. Um, and this has, it's like a point and click adventure game um, where you click different things. That's her dog. If you click this, it's really loud, so I'm not going to play it, but she, he plays the guitar or there's like pictures of us. Um, and I think this is interesting um, or something that I've been thinking about a lot during quarantine is like, what is the internet if you in terms of making, because you can make a web page for anything, but like, what does it mean to make a website for one specific person, for one specific use? Like this is an e-card that people are probably gonna see one time, but then it's, it's like, 
it I think exemplifies like homemade because we're just here and we're just making code that we want to make people smile and I was talking to Shar earlier but she was like it's really fun because it's not like this is not code that somebody's interface depends on so it's really like low stakes and it's just all about like having an idea and just putting it out there and um, if you go to our Twitter uh, we put these stuff up and I thought it was really cool because um, somebody saw our rap project and then they made their own so this was made by Stacy Yuan and Ziyao Li, and it is um, you just make a plant and then you add friends and it's lovely. <laughs> and then people were also sharing um, their own RAS that they made on the RAP maker. And their sweater RAS. Um, so that is the end of my talk and I'm gonna open it up to Q&A. Thank you so much, Tatiana. This was lovely and um it's been a real pleasure to to see your creative work both with your collective and in isolation in your room and sort of in the way that those things meet up um i'm curious uh in terms of your relationship to generativity um uh, yeah I mean, you know so you, you've had this blender program it produces you know these uh ball jointed figures which if you keep pressing a button each one is unique um and um you can also have generativity of, you know, in the embroidery work you're doing with P Embroider, which is, is, you know, great. And and then I see this kind of generativity that happens with uh, the Algorat projects, uh, like the um, the sweater creator, for example. And I'm curious, yeah. I'm curious if your relationship to generativity is is like you're more interested in the way that it can help you make multiples, like towards having like a clone army. Um, uh, or, you know, is it towards about having surprise, like, you know, you'll, you'll keep hitting a button and you'll get um, one that's new that you weren't expecting, uh, or if um, if it's more about interactivity and sharing it, um, you know, with with the, with the public. I think it's it's like I think it, it is in many ways like all of them, but I also think I think mainly it's a, like it, if you write a generative program for something you want to make, you're kind of writing a program that constantly makes gifts for yourself. So if I write. <laughs> Galaxy brain. Wow. This way, I, if I want another doll, I just run this program and then I have one for me. And then it's just, um, but then it's also really nice because I can also make it for other people. <laughs> and I love giving gifts. Like I make a lot of dolls just like to give people for like their birthday is like one of my main practices, I guess. Like, I just like making things for people and I like making things for myself. So I think your connection to gift culture is right at the heart of Art and Code Homemade. 